What's going on guys, it's me your faithful host, Let's Play Dark Souls HD, and welcome back to our in-depth adventure through Elden Ring. So I have a confession to make. This is retrospect commentary because for some reason I did not export my live commentary when I did this episode. I went straight to Demon Souls after I did this recording for some reason. I cannot find the voiceover that I did for this episode, the live version. I know I recorded it because I remember doing the uh I remember doing the noise fixture and all that stuff and saving it and everything, but it has vanished from my computer. I literally cannot find the file. That tells me that I failed to export it. It's just a crucial step that really can't be missed when I'm doing this stuff, but I'm human. We all make mistakes and look at the bright side. Now I'm free to talk about anything I want while you guys watch me play Elden Ring. I'm going to keep it relevant though. So the focus of this episode was to go back down here to Nakron City, and we wanted to go find this gift that Ronnie wants from us. She sent us down here to find a particular treasure, and this is where we're going to find it. The giant statue that's uh, in this level over here that I'm about to look at through the binocular, that's actually where it is. It is all the way down there, beneath this big giant guy sitting in the steps here. And I was looking through the binocular of this guy because I wanted to get a better look at his rings and his outfit to see if there's any, like, notable features. Stuff that might seem present in the lore, anything like that. Wondering if he is an actual giant, like, from the Forbidden Lands. Lots of cool stuff. Questions to ask. But getting down here is pretty simple. You do need to be diligent, though, because as you run around different corners and stuff like that, it's really easy to miss stuff, so... As I do this roof platforming section, you're going to see me run back and forth, and uh, it's just to make sure I don't miss anything, because the whole purpose of this playthrough is to try to provide as much coverage as possible. And for the next hour, you get to see me do that, just like I would normally. So these rejuvenating boluses are actually for the Death Blight buildup. That's what they prevent. Wonder why it would give us those. So your common enemy down here is going to end up being these, like, mimic guys, and they're super easy. It's really funny because as I go through this level, you're going to see these first couple of them just jump off the cliff and die without me having to even fight them. It's pretty damn funny. Like, the one down there shoots at you. And then you see the souls, <laughs> the runes pop up, because <laughs> he ran off the cliff trying to kill me. That's pretty funny. And I keep picking up the silver tear husks that I find everywhere for whatever reason. Uh, the way you want to go is you want to jump on that roof to cross, but if you do that, you will miss out on some of the items that are across the way on the roof over there, where I'm looking right now. So what you ideally want to do is you go up here, get a running jump, and then around this corner, there should be a hidden item. Celestial Dew. Limited per playthrough, those are. I know you can buy them from certain merchants, but I think as far as picking them up on each playthrough, you can only have a certain amount. I don't think there's a way to create them, and you can't buy an infinite amount of them. So, I was looking at the bars here, like noticing how they're destroyed. It kind of looked like something was trying to get in or out of this big building cool little detail and of course I'm checking every corner just to try to be thorough and then you see the other mimic tier down here that's gonna aggro and try to attack us and I did a little bit of experimentation for this part because when I was playing with my friend Jeremy the other day we had this invader that was, like, sniping us from across the map with Frenzy Burst. I wanted to really test its range out here and see how this guy was hitting us so easily. Test successful. It all made sense once I did this, because I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that this guy... We were playing through uh, the Halig Tree on New Game Plus, and... His character 
had already got up to the Halleck Tree again in New Game Plus, but we were getting invaded on the way to Millennia. And this guy that invaded us, look at that. He literally rolled right off the cliff. That's, that is so damn funny. But this guy that invaded us was doing an amazing job of evading us. Like, he was hiding incredibly well. And I'm telling you, like, he was so far away hitting us with these these laser beams, these frenzied eye blasts. I could not understand how he was hitting us because he sure as hell wasn't close enough to lock on to us. I mean, he was like hundreds and hundreds of feet away from us. Like, he was so small and so far away on the screen for us that he was like barely visible. Like, he was barely even rendered on the screen. He was so far away. And he was hitting us with like disgusting precision. Like, blasting us. It was the most frustrating thing ever. Like, he, I'm pretty sure he killed us, like, twice in a row. Like, he killed us while we were trying to fight the ulcerated tree spirit in that area. And then he invaded again and sniped us from, like, this balcony. Killed us both. It was terrible. And for whatever reason, I'm looking at the armor here. Like, I... I think I'm expl I think during this part I was trying to explain the weight of the armor. Yes, here it is. I was looking at the weight of the scythe. I was explaining that off screen I raised my endurance two points because if I alter the crucible knight armor and get rid of the cape, it becomes just light enough to where I can still use my heaviest weapon without changing my armor and be able to medium roll, which was important to me. Cuz I think our heaviest weapon is the halo scythe, which is eight and a half units. I'm actually looking forward to using that thing more to see what it can really do, because that ability that it has is pretty slick. It's really good, like, and it's not situational either. I, like, I feel like that ability is useful pretty much all the time, unless something is directly in your face attacking you. Like, I mean, if there is even a, a small to moderate amount of distance between you and the enemy, that, that ring of light ability is really good and shreds things. So, here we are crossing the rubble to get into this building where we're going to encounter some uh, interesting enemies. We encounter our first ball enemy, which won't be the last one, but it is the first one you've seen in this playthrough. And then there are also some Noxtella swordsmen. Swordswomen. I, I think they're female. Down below. And then here I'm like, I go into immediate sneak mode because I can hear the twinkle. I can hear the... I can hear the iconic sound of glass sprinkling onto a hard surface, and we see the scarab back there. And then the black wet blade. This is going to be your wet blade for changing to arcane scaling side effects. And I end up reading the description here. Maybe. One day. There we go. Yeah, so this one gives you poison, blood, or occult when you are changing the scaling and the Ashes of War on your weapons. So, if you are somebody who wants to use heavy arcane scaling weapons, that is for sure the wet blade that you need in your playthrough. And good that it can be found relatively early in the game, because we are like... I'd say we're barely halfway done with this game. There's still a crushing amount to cover. And I think I was pointing out that I was using the Clean Rot Sword with the Flame Art on it, which ends up scaling with Faith, gives us 377 damage, which doesn't seem like a lot, because our damage with other weapons that we've been using, like Vike Spear and the Halo Scythe, is like in the 600s. It's twice as much. But the thing about this thrusting sword is you see me use it against the Scarab here. It's very fast. It can hit in rapid succession and does quite a bit of damage for how fast it hits. So, coupled with the flame ability on it, it's pretty damn good. I end up using it to clean up a giant really easily later on in this video. And then here you can see that if you go out the ledge... There's a path off to the side that we can follow. Not before we grab this guy, though. You know our motto. Sneaky does it. 
and I check around the corners to make sure there's not a second one waiting to ambush. This is a pretty easy fight. And then you have this room that's full of these big chests, right? These sarcophagus, but this seems to be the only one that actually opens. None of the others give you a prompt to open them. And we got the Mimic Tear Ashes, which is a heavily iconic item in this game. A lot of people who play Elden Ring swear up and down that the Mimic Tear is the best Spirit Ash. Because it does exactly what it says. It's basically summoning a copy of yourself that hits every bit as hard as you do. It's like, it really is almost like summoning one of your friends for help, like another player. The Mimic Tear is very powerful. I'm pretty sure in like the first patch that they released for this game, they had to nerf the Mimic Tear because it was too damn strong. But... That's my advice to you if you're struggling with Elden Ring. Do yourself a favor, grab the Mimic Tear, and I feel pretty set in my ways about this. I feel like the Mimic Tear makes the game a little bit too easy. Like some of the bosses and more difficult fo uh, the like more difficult mobs and groups of enemies in this game tend to be like pathetic if you summon the Mimic Tear because it's just really strong. I do some more experimenting here with the Eye Blast. The Frenzy Burst across this playthrough seems to have really, really, like, consistent damage. Like, pretty much everything seems to get hit very hard by this attack. Like, this is not an easy enemy. These Noxtella swords, Swordsmen are... They're pretty tough. Like, they're beefy and they hit hard. And I like how it just got on the ladder and was like... Here, let me just expose my back to you while you have a laser blast <laughs> from far away. <laughs> like, what? And then it dodged my crossbow. That was funny. But you see the swiftness of the sword come into play right there. For being such a fast weapon, the Clean Rot Knight Sword upgraded to plus 13 actually hits pretty damn hard. And then here, I, I remember this part. This part's kind of like... A little bit cringy and somewhat embarrassing because I decided to play around with these gravity stone chunks and as cool as it was to play around with these things I miss quite a bit like that's cringy and embarrassing <laughs> this one I land and actually it is quite well that did more damage than the eye blast another miss another miss There we go. And then before we take the ladder down and continue into the level, we need to go explore that other path that we saw that goes off to the right here. And you can just jump out the window. And you need a running jump for this part, for sure. You will die if you don't. And you can make short work of this blob sitting here. These blobs that we essentially kill in like one hit if we charge our strong attack. Like if I two-handed my weapon and charged that attack, it for sure would have finished him in one hit. So they're pretty damn easy. And here I was pointing out this big giant bridge that goes underneath. And then down below, we can see the initial area where we fought the Ancestor Spirit the first time. Then up above, you can see the giant bridge that leads us to the second Ancestor Spirit we fought. So we've covered both below and above, and then this is the Mimic Tier boss room that I'm looking at through the telescope. And then this right here, I I don't know why I did this. It was incredibly stupid. Like, don't do this <laughs> if you're watching. Don't, don't do what I do. I, for whatever reason, felt highly compelled to risk dying by platforming all the way down this flying buttress because I thought from software was going to be like a huge asshole and hide an item out here like it would make sense like they totally would but I don't know as careful as I was it ended up being a huge waste of time because 
I just wanted to get out and see, like, that angle. Like, the rear-facing sides of these little towers, just to see if there was an item, like, on the outer edge of one, out of sight. It was not the case, so don't waste your time doing any of that. Guarantee you, they only allowed you to do what I just did, so you will check and potentially die. <laughs> but jumping through this window will get you to the item that was in sight over here. The Nox Flowing Hammer. So, unless you got a hammer drop from, like, maybe a Radon soldier or something, or, like, a Godric soldier, any kind of generic soldier that has, like, the hammer pick type weapon would likely be your first hammer drop in this game. But this weapon is probably going to be your first hammer drop weapon in, in this game if you didn't get one of those from the soldiers. Like, this is the first hammer class weapon we've picked up on this playthrough, I'm pretty sure. Um, <clears throat> that used to not be the case because there used to be a, uh, there used to be a boss in Limgrave, like, a really easy one that was in a catacomb, and you got his hammer pretty early. And I do know that we got, we got the stone hammer from Castle Stormvale, but this weapon in particular is a pretty unique hammer. It is significantly better than either of those. It's got the same attack style. But the weapon art, if you do it correctly, is pretty wild. It's got a very big hitbox. Like that attack. I would totally use this weapon if it wasn't a strength scaling weapon. Because this weapon in particular, if used in the correct situation, like in a catacombs, for example, with the fanged imps or skeletons in numbers, can be quite devastating to those enemies because it is strike damage. So, I wanted to show this off to you guys, just so you could see what it can do. It's a very unique weapon, it's super cool. I've never run into it in, like, PvP, or anything like that, per se, but I have experimented with it moderately on my original character. I did upgrade it a little bit, and I tested it out against, like, skeletons, enemies that are made of stone, stuff like that, and it, it does work, I'm telling you. So that drop, the larval tier came from that giant boulder enemy that we just defeated from above with the gravity magic. And I wanted to stop and look at these guys because they look like the messengers from Bloodborne. There's some really cool imagery going on here. I feel like when you look at those things, you can tell that something truly awful happened in this city. Something afflicted these, these individuals that were here, turned them to stone, and they died in a very, very terrible way. And then for this part, I'm just being cautious and sneaking by because I know exactly how I want to handle this Nox Stella Swordsman, Swordswoman. And that's with a Golden Vow Backstab with Misrecord. Yeah, there's no surviving that. But we did get our blue flask back, so that's nice. And again, I pick up these silver tear husks every single time I see them. I'm, we haven't even used them in this playthrough yet. We have not even tried to craft an item that requires using those things yet. But I'm sure we will at some point. And then it makes sense to rest at this grace, because we don't have to backtrack, so we don't need to worry about any enemies coming back. We only have to worry about these slimes that are out in front of us. And one of them is particularly dangerous and turns into a giant. A little bit of sightseeing here. Seeing just how far down, how deep this place goes. And then looking back up at where the Mimic Tear boss fight is. With the road that leads out to the Ancestor Spirit boss. I don't know how that guy completely missed me. Like, I certainly wasn't mad about it, but it was a little bit weird. <laughs> now, this asshole with the shield ends up breaking my guard. And he gets a critical on me. It's kind of embarrassing, but... I don't know. When I was doing this part, I was like... 
he's, I mean, he's naked, right? Like, he's no armor. So he's basically just, like, completely naked, no armor, no form of protection, just a shield and, and a spear. He really should have had his posture broken by now. Like, I for sure should have broken his posture by this point, at least. But that was not the case. It was very shocking to me. Because so far in this playthrough, we've had no issues getting, like, fully armored, ironclad, powerful enemies to get posture broken with just one guard counter. But, I don't know. That was a fluke to me. It was very strange. And then, the rest of these guys are fine. They don't transform. Except for the very last one in the back there. He will turn into a giant. And what I tried to do against him was I tried to experiment, I tried to use the, the weapon art, you'll see what I mean, to try to kill him as fast as possible to prevent the transformation because I knew it was coming. But it ended up not working. I think the game truly forces you to fight this thing in its giant state because I tried as hard as I could to get up here and get the damage in and it just didn't work. Maybe if you one-shot him from far away, like I probably should have used lightning spear or something like that, but... It's all good. I checked for sleep bolts, because we all know that that's the best way to handle the giants. But I was out. So I ended up just improvising. I'm gonna showcase the Ash of War and get completely Hulk smashed. And then I come to my senses and I realize that we should just handle this the way anybody would. Let's just get some, some really solid hits in on his legs. Knock him over and let Misericord do the work. While getting stepped on. So that was easy. It only took like two fully charged hits. And then Misericord does all the heavy lifting. And then here comes the sword. Decided to try to use a Frenzied Flame ability on him just to see what kind of damage it does. And it did, it did all right. That roll was pretty early. That was kind of an amateur mistake. And then I decided, why not? Let's try out the gravity on him. Let's see what it does. And... Would you look at that? It was kind of like the equivalent of stepping on a Lego. If the Lego protruded out of the ground and grew in size, stabbing through your foot. Kind of similar, right? And then from this point, we are well and truly done with Nokron. I end up picking up this last butterfly over here. And why not? Let's grab our final silver tier husk. Which I guess that it makes sense. That's probably what those enemies are called. The blobs or slimes I keep calling them. That they're probably their enemy name is probably a silver tier. Because this husk that we're picking up is like pieces of them left behind. So the only thing left to do at this point is head up the stairs and get the treasure. Take it back to Ronnie. They even leave you a convenient teleporter that takes you straight back up to the grace that we started the episode at. But me, being thorough LP, of course, had to run all the way the fuck around this thing just to find out that there's nothing. So take advantage of my thoroughness, ladies and gentlemen, and... uh Watch and learn when not to waste your time. Because I have no trouble double and triple and quadruple checking stuff like this. Just so you guys don't have to deal with it. And then this big fancy chest is going to be exactly what we need. Finger Slayer Blade. And then we also get a great Ghost Glove War, which is fantastic because that is essentially your cap upgrade item for special spirit summons. So whichever spirit summon we decide to max out, which, yeah, I mean, based on my history in this game, is likely going to be my bodyguard, Battle Mage Hughes, but we haven't collected him yet, so I'll probably save that. And 
I will say this. I really, really should have read the description of this item. Like, seriously, should have read the description and showcased it to you guys first. But I think I've just been so eager to, like, push this quest forward so we can get it done that I didn't bother with that. And I ended up just running straight to Ronnie and giving it to her without question. So that's a mistake on my part. That's my bad. So she's been asleep this whole time. We've gone back and tried to visit her multiple times while uh, going through Nakron and Noxtella, both Eternal Cities, and progressing through the game. And every time we come back, she seems to be asleep. And that's me trying to be smart and sending the elevator back down so we don't have to pull the lever every single time we come here to see her. But she's going to magically be awake now. Ah, it was thee, not blithe it seemeth. Even in my slumber, I sensed it. It is in thy possession, is it not? The hidden treasure of Nokron. My thanks. Finally, all the pieces are in place. Soon must I begin my journey. Upon the dark path, only I may tread. Ah, but before I leave, I must entrust thee with this. Take it. The carrion inverted statue is something we're going to actually use in this episode as soon as we finish this conversation. My discarded flesh lieth beyond the seal unlocked by it, upon which is carved the curse mark of thy desire. I can fathom what thy purpose might be. Neither of us is welcomed by the brighter path, I see. You may leave now. It was but brief. But thou gavest me fine service. What is it? Thy purpose in approaching me was to obtain the curse mark, was it not? You may leave now. I too am to depart on a journey. Upon the dark path only I may tread. What is it? Thy purpose you may leave. I too. So Rani essentially is relinquishing her dealings with us because she's under the impression that we only wanted to work for her and be in her service because she was holding information that we wanted, which was the location of the curse mark. The curse mark of the curse rune of death, uh, destined death, I like to refer to it as, or the, the, the centipede it's been referred to. There's been a lot of talk about this curse mark, this rune of death. The entire plot of the game resonates with this thing. And we are on the precipice of finding it. So this is where you would place the inverted statue. But we don't want to do that as soon as we get here because, you'll recall, we have not actually gone through this place yet. And it's a very small dungeon. Like, it's just a very short run through here from start to finish. But you do have to complete it twice in order to get everything. You run through it once, like normal, and then you place a statue and invert it, and you run through it completely backwards, upside down. It's kind of cool. So I end up switching back to the War Spear for this, because we're going to need it. We're about to fight a seriously pain-in-the-ass NPC that does a ton of damage, is highly evasive, and will give you a lot of trouble if you're not prepared. So the reason that I want to use the spear is, well, I can think of two really great reasons to use the spear. One, it's my highest damage weapon by far right now, and it shreds through everything in this level. Like these stupid hands are very weak to thrust and slash damage. As you can see, it rips through them. But you do have these spectral fellows that get summoned across the level. But because this thing is plus nine, and we're not exactly low level, we make short work of them. We can one-shot these dudes pretty easily. But the NPC that's about to get summoned is highly problematic. And I wanted to experiment because the NPC is tarnished like us. It's like a humanoid enemy. And I wanted to see if we could proc the madness. So 
spoiler, it ends up going fantastically. Like, wait till you guys see how I deal with this stupid ass NPC. Like, this NPC gave me so much trouble in my first playthrough, and I read so many Reddit posts about how annoyed and frustrated people were with trying to fight this asshole, and I end up making incredibly short work of this enemy. Like, this is the easiest they have ever been to deal with. And I think it's because we were just really, really well equipped when stepping into this place. So that Loretta's great bow that they keep firing at us does a ton of damage. Like, I get hit with a partial hit through the wall. Like, do you see that? That's a partial hit through the wall, and it wasn't even fully charged, and that's how much damage it did to me. Pretty ridiculous. But I end up choosing an opportune time to go running through, dodging, waiting for the opportune moment to use the weapon art. And it goes pretty well. So there's nothing you can do to finish that NPC off right there. I would imagine the only possible way you could kill her without letting her advance into the into the, the level is you would have to somehow kill her in a single hit on the first try. And because this is a higher level and more difficult enemy to face, I can't imagine how much, like, I can't imagine how much attack power that would take. I can't imagine how many buffs you would need to do before taking your single shot to finish her in one hit. It would take a lot of preparation. And you'd probably have to be, like, level 200 and something. Like, what I'm saying is, your damage would have to be flat out disgusting to be able to prevent her from teleporting and going further into the stage. Miriam. So, our eye blast ended up being faster than her bow, which is great. But, unfortunately, we could not stop her from continuing to disappear and go further into the level, which is a hassle for us, but it's okay. And we just picked up our first staff of carrion nature, which I think is interesting. I don't think I pull that weapon up to showcase it or look at it, because there's nothing spectacular about it in the lore or anything like that. It's a really basic description, but I will point out that from what I understand, if memory serves, that staff will augment your carrion sorceries, which could be highly useful because a lot of the carrion spells are more sort of up close in your face style, which is a fun play style. But this is the very last place that Miriam goes. She does not teleport anywhere after this, and I end up just like finishing her off with the eye blast. It ends up being complete cake. Didn't die to her once, didn't give us any trouble, only got hit once, and it was through a wall. But yeah, this is... This is money right here, like, ended up making it super easy to kill her. And then you get Downpour, which, that is the exact sorcery that you saw her using over there, where the, you form the little orb over your head, and then it rains small, insignificant, like, incredibly weak, and I would say redundant blasts of magic. Like, the spell is quite trash. I, I don't think it's very good. It's very similar to what the Crystal Mage uses in Dark Souls 3. And it wasn't good in that game either. But you see me just kind of cleaning house here. We'll circle all the way around, take care of all these clowns. They don't respawn, thankfully, unless you rested a grace. But there's only one item to grab here. And our final set of bad guys. course, one of them had to get a stab on me. All that for a tier 4 golden rune. Worth. And now the only thing left to do before we invert this place, which is incredibly freaky, like it's, it's a highly original concept that I think is pretty damn cool, is we just need to go up this ladder. Just grab this item that's hanging out up here on top of these rafters. And I really hate what they did here for this part. Like, I don't, I don't hate, 
I don't hate them for trying and doing this, but did I mean do you see how much damage it took? That that rat had like a thousand HP. That is what I don't like about this part, is you have these rafters, and of course there's rats, right? So therefore, you are presented this element of danger of okay, clearly I'm gonna have to be very careful because it's not just platforming, it's not just the risk of falling and dying that I'm dealing with. I have to deal with rats too. And rats can be incredibly inconvenient and unpredictable. They have attacks that, that nudge you and shove you and interrupt your attacks. Rats on a rafter can be an incredibly bad time because it's not the first time they've done that in a Dark Souls type game. Like, fighting rats on, like, skinny beams has happened in probably every single Souls game. So it's not like we're strangers to it. But I feel like they were serious assholes here when they did this because the rats are already a problem and will already significantly increase your chances of falling and dying here. But then they made them, like, strong. Like, this is... <laughs> Our stats, we have, like, 40 faith and, like, 30-something dexterity on a plus nine Vikes War Spear, and we still could not kill them in just one hit. Like, we could not one-tap the rats. Like, to me, that was kind of ridiculous. Like, and our damage with this spear is very, very fucking good for our level. Like, for where we are in the playthrough, we have really good damage with this spear. Like, significantly better than if we were using a regular weapon. And yet, I don't know. That one we could one-tap because we snuck up behind him, but I'm just imagining other players going through this part maybe a little bit earlier than we are and just hacking and hacking and hacking at these rats trying to kill them and just getting pushed off and dying or whatever, and it's just... Uh, I imagine it being highly irritating. I think it was <laughs> really... I think it was really dirty for them to make these rats this beefy and durable. They knew what they were doing, though. They knew. So that is the entirety of the normal version of this dungeon. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the elevators back down. And we're going to place the statue. And we're going to turn this bitch upside down. And when you redo it upside down, you might think, oh, well, you're just going to have to do everything backwards now. Nope. No, sir. It actually becomes quite interesting. There's new enemies that you face. They do change it up quite a bit. And no, I don't recommend resting at the Grace because, from what I understand, none of the enemies in this version of the dungeon will come back and interact with you if you do rest at the Grace. But... I didn't chance it. I just decided I wasn't going to rest at the grace because I did not want to risk certain enemies respawning because I already know what's in store for us once we once we invert this place. Like, I already know how much of a pain in the ass it's going to be to do it upside down. So this is a pretty cool contraption. I thought this was a globe the first time I saw it. But if you look closely, you can actually see that this is a tool that's designed to showcase different phases of the moon. Because that's a moon in there, not an earth. It's the little things. And as you can see, shit's upside down now. So, gotta jump down, do a little bit of platforming, and we're gonna have some hands to deal with. They're weak. They're incredibly weak. We kill them in one hit. The problem is there's a lot of them, though. And look, our best friend is back. Miriam, round two. 
and my aim is as bad as ever. Yep. Great job. Great job, LP. Now you're out. Well, fantastic. <laughs> you're on a roll. So that damage, pretty damn good. We're able to completely interrupt that stupid great bow attack that is the death of many players. And look at that, we were able to successfully inflict the madness, which gave us an opportunity to get some additional damage in. Couldn't finish her off, still disappeared, but it's fine. It's a winning strategy. So the only thing really left to do at this point is drop down and get the item below, finish off any spectral enemies that are prowling near Miriam, and then we'll be heading up to the Divine Tower, which that's the whole purpose of doing this mini dungeon, is to gain access to the Divine Tower of Lyurnia. That's our objective right now, because Ronnie has told us the one thing that is of interest to us which is the location of Destined Death. So this Mask of Confidence is actually the mask that Celibus wears. I don't end up reading the description for this mask because I was pretty distracted with uh, the task at hand, trying to kill these guys, get rid of Miriam, and since these guys were coming after me, and I, I don't know, I just didn't have time to read it, and then I ended up forgetting about it, but I left a note here on my desk to go look at the description of that item because there is something I want to talk about with that helmet. We're going to read the description in the next video. I promise I won't fuck up the commentary again on that one. And uh, you will see that there's some pretty cool information that is within the description of that item. So more hands. More hands that want to throw hands with LP. It ends the same for all of them. Shit, you want to talk about destined death? Fuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> There's your destined death, pal. And if you're wondering why I tiptoed off that edge, is because I have PTSD. On my first playthrough, I tried to just casually walk off the edge, thinking it'd be fine and I wouldn't fall. Now, if you walk off that edge too fast, I'm living proof that you will fall and die. It sucks. That somber smithing stone was a drop that came from... One of the hands, by the way. I forgot that they dropped that stuff. So here we go. Finishing the job. Going Cyclops on this bitch, man. And then... I end up using it again, but we trade. It's fine because I end up killing her, but... It's whatever. And then you get Lucidity, which is a highly ironic sorcery to pick up from Miriam. Alleviates buildup of sleep and madness. That could have been pretty useful to her while she was getting laser beamed by madness from me, but it is what it is. I guess she wasn't smart enough to use it. Of course these guys throw shit. We dealt with this at Carrion Manor. Bunch of bullshit. Here we go again. And these guys are pretty easy. Like, you see that, we can damn near one-tap these guys. That was a satisfying kill. And of course we get the Brass Shield, and oddly enough, I recall in great detail going on a huge tangent about my shield on this part i remember showcasing you know, my shield and being like you know the, the brass shield is objectively better on paper than this shield but like i remember saying look at this fucking shield though like who the hell would not want to use this shield even if the brass shield was flat out better and had more stability better resistances etc like i don't know i just remember being like I remember specifically saying in the live commentary, I wouldn't care if this, if the Brass Shield had triple the stability of, like, the, uh, the Banished Night Shield. I remember thinking to myself, yeah, it's got better resistances, and it ends up having better stability if you keep upgrading it and whatever, 
But just look how ugly it is. I mean, it's hideous. The shape of it is irritating and an eyesore. Doesn't flow with the armor. That, though, that is like Lothric Knight Shield sexiness. And we all remember in Dark Souls 3, the Lothric Knight Shield was the best medium shield in the game because it looked the best, had fantastic stability, and that is the role that the Banished Knight Shield plays in this game. Looks fantastic, has really, really damn good stability for how much it weighs, and the resistances are acceptable. When it comes to that brass shield, I wouldn't care if it was a thousand times better. I still wouldn't use it. It's hideous. But enough of that. Now all we have to do is pick up a couple items on these rafters. No rats this time. Thank God. I walk over here for a second just to see, like, can we get in there? Is there a way to get in there? But I end up realizing, no, that's just the entryway from the regular version. And judging by, like, how the floor is the ceiling, there's no possible way you could get over there. So that was an easy one to dismiss. Now all we have to do is well, I, I try to hit the chain <laughs> to see if we can if we can make the chandeliers that are still somehow obeying gravity fall like towards the sky. That would have been really cool, but Glintstone Fireflies. That item prompted there, you'll notice, which suggests that we have not picked those up yet. Because when you have not picked an item up yet, like this. You get a prompt in the middle of the screen that's larger and easier to read, notifying you, hey, you've never picked this up before. Because any item that you have already picked up ends up being just like the regular, smaller prompt that shows up on the bottom right of the screen. So the only thing left to do now is take the elevator, which, for us, is going to go down. But in reality, we are going up very, very high up into the Divine Tower. And holy shit, we run into a really, really troublesome Godskin Royal, I think is what he's called. Noble, yeah, Godskin Noble. And yeah, of course, me being me, knowing for a fact that I've already done this on my other character, Sweeped through this room thinking they're gonna hide something in here. There's gotta be something. There's not. And you know what? Even after doing it again on this character, I guarantee you on my third character, I'm gonna do it again. Because for some reason, I can't just not do it. How about this Crucible Knight armor, though? It looks really, really damn good. And I don't know if you guys are noticing the way I'm noticing. Every single armor set that we wear in this game seems to go incredibly well with the bandit mask. Like, I have yet to put on a piece of armor that does not go with this mask. It's pretty awesome. But this godskin noble that we fight is so troublesome. And I believe sincerely in my heart that this godskin noble being here is the whole reason that they put this grace right on the bridge. It's gotta be. Because I have a feeling this guy's gonna give people a lot of trouble. And you see me here restocking on sleep bolts because this is the answer against the Godskin enemies. Whether you're fighting the Godskin Noble or the Godskin Apostle or both of them at the same time because this fucking game does that to you for whatever reason sleep is the answer so i am getting ready with these bolts ready to put this dude to sleep ready to jam misericord into his jugular because that's what he deserves we get to pick up these rune fragments on the way there it's symbolic rune fragments because we're gonna ruin his anus That was highly suggestive. I shouldn't have said that. So 
So three bolts. Three bolts is kind of the magic number with this guy. I believe that there is some sort of like kind of monster hunter effect that we can't really see in this game because all status effect bars in this game are invisible to us. We cannot see bleed buildup, sleep buildup, scarlet rot buildup, anything like that. It's just something that kind of happens invisibly, but we know it's happening. But what I mean by Monster Hunter effect is when you play Monster Hunter, if you're using some kind of status effect like sleep or poison or something, the monster's resistance to that status effect grows per use. So I'll use sleep for an example because it's relevant here since we're using sleep. If you use sleep in Monster Hunter and you successfully put that monster to sleep, with that status effect, say you had to hit them like, I don't know, five times with your sleep weapon to put them to sleep. Once you greatsword charge them or bomb them or whatever, whatever damage it is you intend to do with the sleep effect, once they wake up from that status effect, they will not take five hits to put to sleep anymore. Their resistance will naturally grow. So, the next time you try to afflict that monster with that same sleep effect, it will now take you, let's say, 8 successful hits. And then after that, it'll take like 12, you know, like it just continues to multiply. And they, their resistance grows. I think that that kind of effect exists in this game. Because you see, we hit him with 3 bolts again already. Now it's taking 4. And I don't remember how many times I put him to sleep. I think I put him to sleep like 3 times. But I begin to notice that his resilience to the sleep effect grows with each use. And can I just say, by the way, I I abhor this enemy. Like, I despise the enemy because of this. Like, I can never figure out what it is you're supposed to do against that attack. Like, it plagues me. Like, some of his obnoxious, like, smoke attacks are <laughs> easy to get away with, or to get away from. But when he expands and starts doing that roly-poly shit, like, I hate it. It makes my blood boil. So that was three. I guess I put him to sleep a grand total of four times. So that's one, two, three, four... Five. And then watch this. Six. Watch how close this gets. Seven. And then there's eight. And then nine. <laughs> the sleep interrupted his rolling attack. And that completely saved my ass. Like, I was not going to take a chance on losing any damage. Like, we golden vowed and everything. And then watch. As soon as I try to finish him, he completely interrupts me. Like, this... I'm telling you. It really saddens me that the live version of this commentary was lost to the depths of existence. Because if you could hear how panicked and irritated I was get during this fight, it probably would have given you days worth of entertainment. I was getting pretty heated. Like, during that part where I kept just, I mean, filling him with those those bolts to try to get him to go to bed as he rolled into me, I was like, go to bed, go to bed, go to bed, go to bed! And, yeah. But I did showcase the armor here. This armor is incredibly good, especially for how much it weighs. Its physical defenses are nothing special. But the resistances to magic, fire, lightning, holy, immunity, focus, vitality, and all that stuff, it looks stupid <laughs> if you can get over looking like a clown it's fine but as you can see not all pieces look terrible it can be quite stylish but that armor in particular because it's so light and because it has such incredible resistances to pretty much everything that would totally be a very very good armor to wear in pvp
because you could supplement the lack of physical defense it has with like the uh what's it called the 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 something drake talisman plus two that raises your physical defense like through the roof you could totally use one of that one of your talisman slots for that and then you could have all the defense that you were missing out on the physical defense anyway and you could be quite durable if you wore that armor I think a lot of people prefer to look, like, a little more fashionable. And I can tell you right now, I don't see anybody. In, and I PvP pretty regularly in this game when I'm not, like, doing this playthrough and I'm not recording and I'm not uploading content. This is kind of what I do, is I like to PvP in Elden Ring. But I can tell you for certain that I don't run into people that wear that armor. And it baffles me because your survivability against, like, sorcerers... People who use poison, you know, even like faith builds and stuff is very, very good with that armor. Your survivability goes through the roof if you were to wear the godskin armor. It just looks incredibly stupid, and that's probably what stops people from using it. I ran towards this, like, black thing that was kind of like dripping through the air. Like, I, I shit you not, I 100% thought that, like, a portal to the nether realm was opening in front of me, and it just drew me in. I don't know what that says about me as a person, but this part of this video is very, very cool. I have to be serious about this part. I have to be, <clears throat> I have to compose myself, become professional for this part. During my first playthrough of Elden Ring, discovering what's at the top of this tower was incredibly moving for me. It's one of the most memorable moments of this game, in my opinion. And it is so worth savoring. A familiar grace that we get at the top of every divine tower that we've discovered so far. And when you wander the top of the steps, usually you expect to see what's at the top of the other towers. Which would be deceased fingers. But not this time. This time there's a body. But it's not just any body. This isn't just any ordinary corpse. This is the corpse that we were looking for. This corpse contains the very thing that Roger died looking for. Do you see the back? Look familiar? This is Ronnie's corpse. This is her, corpor her corporeal flesh. This is her actual body before she inhabited the doll that we see before us when we speak to her as the Snow Witch. No birds. No life up here. It's desolate, unlike the other towers. This is a special place, and they've gone out of their way to hide it. This is why she didn't want to tell us. It's the centipede. This is the rune of death that she hid so well from everybody and refused to tell us about. This is destined death. And we also get a talisman, the Stargazer Heirloom. And this is an important item. I didn't forget to read this one, because it's very relevant. A talisman engraved with the legend of a queen raises intelligence. The young astrologer gazed at the night sky as she walked. She had always chased the stars every step of her journey. Then she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen. The full moon is Ranala. And we learn that Rani must have been an astrologer before she became the Snow Witch, before she became the doll, before she decided to go down this path that she's been treading. These bracelets and this brooch that are gold with these brightly colored rubies in them is a familiar sign. This jewelry symbolizes relation to Radagon. And it makes sense because Rani is Radagon's daughter. Pretty good view from up here. But the top of this tower is very different from the rest of the Divine Towers across the lanes between. It has a sort of energy about it. 
And it's one of my favorite parts of any playthrough in this game, is discovering the body that has the curse mark of death on it. So that is probably a perfect place to go ahead and end this episode. Lots of cool stuff we uncovered today. Learned about Ronnie, learned about the curse mark, the rune of death, destined death, its many names, and the storytelling that surrounds it. Lots of cool lore information. But in the next episode, we are probably going to go back to the Angel River Well, because that's where we left off in the previous episode to this. And we have unfinished business down there. We need to keep pushing forward. But sorry again for messing up with the commentary and having to do retrospect. I hope I was still able to be entertaining to some extent to you guys. But thank you for joining me on Elden Ring. I've been your faithful host. Let's play Dark Souls HD. And I will catch all of you guys in the next video.